Okay, thanks for that nice introduction, Beth. Um, Aaron and I are both excited to be here to share with you the results of some research that we've been working on um, with a host of other people for the last three years. Um, so I'm just going to start off by letting you know what our objectives are for this presentation. Um, first, we want to give you an overview of our project, um, who was involved, why we were interested in monitoring these barns, and how we collected our measurements. Um, We've collected a lot and a lot of data over the last two years, so we're not going to have time to go over all of the data today, but we will hit on some of the high points. Um, after I finish that, I'm going to talk about some of our particulate matter or dust um, data and demonstrate differences in particulate matter uh, between days of normal operation and days when bedding is added to the pen. Then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Erin to focus on um, the the gas concentration and the airflow and, and uh, gas emission data. And she's going to uh, discuss how our airflow data, um, talk about some of the difficulties in obtaining the accurate airflow data in the naturally ventilated barn. And she's going to talk about um, the variability in the data and the challenges of trying to come up with just one emission value uh, for these, these deep bed and monoslope facilities. So I'm just going to start by giving a very, very brief overview of what deep bed and monoslope barns are. Um, some of you may have listened in on our May webcast, and it's a lot more in-depth uh, discussion of this, but the deep bedded barns are a newer type of cattle facilities. Um, construction first began about 10 years ago in the northern Great Plains, and a majority of these buildings have been built in the last five to six years. Um, most of the barns are east-west, have an east-west orientation with a southern exposure. They are naturally ventilated with a curtain side on the north side of the barn. Producers are using a stocking density of about 38 to 50 square foot per animal. Uh, they may allow a, a bed pack to accumulate in the center of the pen, which is the, uh, the manure and the, the bedding material, or they may scrape and haul that, uh, all the manure and bedding out of there on a weekly basis. Depending on which pack they use, they do scrape the area around the bedded pack um, one to two times a week to keep that clean. And um, corn stalks and bean stubble are the, the most common types of bedding material that are used. But with this being said, there was a lot that we still don't know about, about these barns. And this project um, really kind of all started back in March of 2007 when a group of us from USDA Meat Animal Research Center decided to visit some monoslope barns in northwest Iowa. At that time, the monoslope barns were just becoming very popular, and producers cited an ease of manure management and improved animal performance compared to open feedlots. Um, and the improvement in animal performance was mostly observed during seasons with, with extreme weather conditions. But again, we didn't know anything about the environment in these monoslope barns or the effect on site-specific management. So USDA and Iowa State University um, started a project a research study to, to look at some of these questions. And we connected uh, a study from March of 2008 to October of 2009 using two pens in two 100-foot wide barns. Um, both the barns had an east-west orientation, and we did sampling every five to seven weeks to measure um, ammonia emissions in these barns. Um, the, uh, the, the main research goal was to determine if there were spatial effects of ammonia emissions on the pen surface. Uh, for example, is there a consistent pattern of where ammonia had the highest concentration, such as you know, on the pack or on the edges around the pack or maybe on the bunk apron? And then we also wanted to determine how season affected ammonia emissions from the pen surface. So we laid out a grid of 56 sampling points, and we used flex chambers to collect ammonia concentrations from the pen surface. And we collected those for about 20 minutes. But this data didn't represent absolute values from the barn, um, and so that question was still out there. So in the spring of, of 2009, researchers from South Dakota State University, uh, the Meat Animal Research Center, and Iowa State University pulled together an advisory group of 19 members, and these, these members represent education, the cattle industry, uh, agricultural industry, and government agency. This group was brought together to offer us advice and support for a collaborative research project, and, and they continue to serve in an, an advisory role even to this day. But this group of people were asked about their concerns related to beef monoslope facilities. 
And this is the list of concerns that they came up with. And one of their primary concerns was related to air quality regulation. Um, just kind of to give a little background, background, beginning in the 1980s, regulations were passed to protect the air and water from environmental contaminants that were created by the heavy industry. And air quality re regulations, including the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, which is commonly called EPCRA, were passed. Um, EPCRA requires owners and operators to notify the proper authorities when certain amounts of hazardous substances are released into the air. And traditionally, livestock and poultry industries believe that they were exempt from these regulations. However, that changed when the courts clarified that livestock and poultry operations were indeed required to follow these reporting guidelines. Unfortunately, there was no generally agreed upon air emission estimates for most livestock and poultry facilities. And currently, reports use a single value for ammonia and hydrogen sulfide that's based on data from open lot feedlots in four states, some of them being southern. And, and these, this data was collected during the summertime. So this probably is not reflective of deep bedded barns. The advisory committee was also concerned about particulate matter or dust. Um, PM10 or particulate matter 10 is a coarse particulate matter. It can get into your esophagus. Well, PM2.5 is a fine particulate matter, and that can settle down into the bottom of your lungs. So there's a lot of concern with dust um, around livestock facilities. And at the first advisory committee meeting, one of our members said, uh, this dust issue is going to be huge. So there's a lot of concern about that. Um, other concerns of the advisory committee were how air quality can change throughout the day or from one season to the next. And um, at the end of the day, the members of the advisory committee really just wanted to know if the monoslopes were being managed in the best way possible. So their question really was, um, are, are they doing it right? And so that led to our, our grant, which is um, Emission Measurements and Comparisons of Management Techniques for Beef Deep Bedded Monoslope Facilities. And this project is funded by the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative Cooperative Grant um, through USDA. So I'll just take a minute and introduce you to our team here. Um, again, this project was funded by the USDA AFRI Air Quality Grant. And it includes researchers from South Dakota State University, from the USDA Meat Animal Research Center, from Iowa State University um, Extension and Outreach, and also from the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center. Um, Researchers at South Dakota State University and USDA were primarily responsible for the research component of the grant, and then SCSU, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, and the LPELC head up our extension and outreach efforts. So the, ma the main purpose of the air quality grant was to gather baseline data from beef confinement barns that could be used um, for reporting purposes. And then as a secondary objective, we wanted to compare the two manure handling systems that were being used in these barns. So with that in mind, we included two barns in our study that had a weekly um, total scrape and haul system. And again, in those systems, no bedded pack is allowed to accumulate in the barns. They remove the manure and the bedding on a weekly basis. And then we included two barns that did allow um, a, a deep bedded pack to be maintained in the center of the barn. And in those barns, they just uh, scrape the area around the bedded pack on a weekly basis. Um, so the, it just turned out that the weekly scrape and haul systems were our two South Dakota sites, and the bed pack systems were our two Iowa sites. So uh, this, this slide has a lot of information on, but I would just uh, highlight the, the pen capacity data up here. Um, we had two pens that were monitored in each of the South Dakota, in each of the South Dakota barns, and each pen had a 300 head capacity. Um, and the barns may have had additional pens, but we just measured two in, in those uh, facilities. At the Iowa site, um, one barn had a capacity of 499 head, while the other had a 200 head capacity. So because barn one had a larger pen size, we only monitored one pen in barn one while well, we monitored two pens in barn two. But both of these barns had additional pens that were not part of this monitoring study. So at each facility, we had, um, we had uh, weather sites that were measured. We put up weather stations. We measured wind direction, wind speed, ambient air temperature, and relative humidity. Uh, 
We also had, uh, again, we had two barns located in South Dakota and two barns located in Iowa. Um, each, each state had one instrument trailer. And so two barns each were monitored, and one instrument trailer rotated between the Iowa barns and one trailer rota rotated between the two South Dakota barns. So we had continuous gas measurements were taken from each barn for four months each year for the two-year study. Um, our, the sampling locations on the north and the south side of the barn measured ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. And then our particulate matter was measured periodically. And I'll discuss some more details about that later. So all of the wiring and tubing from all of the instruments and the inlets um, came to our instrument trailer. Inside the instrument trailer were all of the gas sampling equipment. And then a computer recorded all of the gas measurements as well as the weather data. Um, our particulate matter monitoring, we had two different systems. Um, to, to measure the particulate matter, many bowls were used periodically at, the, at both South Dakota State um, sites. And that collected kind of a baseline emission data. And we didn't have sufficient equipment to monitor the Iowa sites using the mini bowls, but we did, also, but we did want to gather some baseline data from the bedpack barns. Uh, so we kind of had a little more intensive project that we did with some collaboration from our ARS colleagues at the Cotton Production and Processing Research Unit in Lubbock, Texas. And we measured um, using these low ball particulate samples. And, and that's what I'm going to, to take a minute here and discuss now is, is kind of part one. And that's our particulate matter adjacent to cattle deep bedded monoslope facilities. So the objective of this part of the project was to compare particulate matter adjacent to the monoslope facilities during hours of normal operation and during hours of a bedding event when, when bedding is being added to the barn. So again, we used our, our low vol particulate matter samplers. We had three that were placed 15 feet from the north side of the barn and three that were placed 15 feet from the south side of the barn. And on each side of the barn, there was 120 feet between the samplers. And they were set at a steady flow rate. So here's the pictorial again. You can see that we have the, the blue uh, samplers on the north side of the barn and the red samplers on the south side of the barn. So each sampler contained pre-weighed filters that were inserted into the, the low vol sampler at the beginning of, of each collection period. We had two sample periods, one in April and May of 2011, and the other in June and July of 2011. And we were not able to collect samples every day during those periods due to rain. Um, however, both sample periods did include three 24-hour collections during normal operations and two three-hour collections during a bedding event. So at the end of each, of each collection period, the filters were collected and sent to the cotton production uh, processing unit down in Texas. And they determined particulate matter. The ARIS facility in Lubbock, Texas was able to determine the amount of total suspended particles, or TSP. And that includes both particulate matter 10 and particulate 2.5 uh, samples. And, and we were also able to determine the percentage of, of the total suspended particles that were PM10 and PM2.5. But in the interest of time today, I'm only going to present the, the total suspended particle data. And so that's what we're going to get into the results here. So this is a chart of the total suspended particles during the April 28th to May 5th sampling of period. The bedding events occurred on, on the 29th and on, the, on May 2nd. And our 24 hour hours of normal operation were on the 28th, the 4th, and the 5th of May. Um, on this graph on the next, the concentration of total suspended particles is, is shown on the y-axis and the dates shown on the x-axis. So total suspended particles from the, the low vol samplers on the north side of the barn are shown in blue, while those shown on the south side of the barn are shown in red. So we did have a significantly higher concentration of total suspended particles on days when there was a bedding event going on compared to days of normal operation. And on April 29th, we see that there was a prevailing south wind during the three-hour bedding event. And that's indicated by higher particulate matter concentrations for the samples collected on the north side of the barn compared to the south side of the barn. And on May 2nd, uh, we see just the opposite effect in that we had a prevailing north wind with higher concentrations on the south side of the barn compared to the north side of the barn. 
So overall, we see very low particulate matter concentration for the deep bedded barns during hours of normal operation. Okay, and, and this is a, a chart of the total suspended particles during the, the June 4th to July 1st sampling event. Um, again, the bedding events occurred on the, the 24th and the 28th. Um, we had the 24-hour samplings on the, on the 29th, the 30th, and the 31st. And as with the previous sample, we see um, higher concentrations of total suspended particles on the days when we have the bedding events compared to the days of normal operation. And on June 24th, there was just a slight, uh, a slight south wind. It was only about 1.9 meters per second moving through the barn, but it did give us higher concentrations on the north side of the barn. And June 28th was kind of an interesting sampling event. Um, the wind happened to change during that three-hour sampling period. And so we had um, high concentrations on both the north and the south side on that day. But one interesting thing to note about the bedding events is that these elevated concentrations are very short-lived. If you look at the June 29th sampling period, less than 24 hours after we had the really high concentrations on that bedding event, there's very little total suspended particles emitted from the barn on that day. So the average 24-hour total suspended particle concentration on days of normal operation was about 58, um, whereas on hours when we did the three-hour particulate matter concentrations during the bedding event, it was as high as averaged about 702. Um, in an open lot feedlot, reported values have been about 410. So you can see that we have significantly higher total suspended particles during uh, bedding events compared to normal operations but they're not necessarily higher than an open lot feedlot. So our conclusions for part one is that in general, particulate matter concentrations adjacent to the deep bed of monoslope facilities are lower than previously reported for open feedlots, um, but they do tend to be higher during those three-hour bedding events. 